morning. Would you stand with me this morning and take your hand? I'll turn to 100. Love Divine. On Love Excelling, page 100. We'll sing all four verses as we begin our service this morning.
bulletin, or if you haven't gotten a bulletin, there are some in the back. Just point out a couple of things that are under the announcements. Uh, on the back bulletin board here in the foyer, there is a, a sign-up sheet for mowing grass, both here around the church and over at the parsonage. I see there are still quite a few open spots on there as I looked this morning. And so if you're interested in doing that, you don't have to bring a mower. There, up here, there's a mower up there. Just make arrangements and that will be gotten out for you. Uh, just give you an opportunity to spend some time up here. Also, uh, donations for the Lapeer, Crisis, or the Lapeer Pregnancy Center. Still collecting those as uh, you put those in the offering plate. If you mark those for that, and we'll be collecting those up through July the 15th. And then finally, it says since uh, VBS has been canceled for the summer, there will be. They're asking if you'd be interested in hosting a five-day club at your home. If you're interested in that, if you would get a hold of Anna Barra, she would get you scheduled for those five-day clubs. Basically, all you need to do is have a place for them in your yard or a garage or something. Uh, I guess if it was going to be raining, we haven't seen any of that in a while, but if we uh, start getting some rain, maybe you have a plan B for hosting some kids. Other than that, uh, some of the prayer requests that were given in the Sunday school class this morning, Rose's sister was asked for and should be traveling down to see her this week. So keep her in your prayers this week as uh, she and her other sister travel there uh, to spend some time with her. Let's go to prayer this morning. Our dear Holy Father, we thank you for this place so that we can come and worship you. Lord, uh, we just thank you for each one of these brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and family that are here this morning, that taking this, the time to, uh, to exercise their faith and being here and uh, exercise their liberty that this country has given us, that we have freedom of religion. We thank you for that. We thank you for this country that you sustained over these years, for the many sacrifices that many men and women have made uh, to keep our freedoms. And during this turbulent time right now, we just pray that you would continue to keep our freedoms, and uh, Lord, we thank you for them, that we would never get complacent. Lord, we pray for our worship service this morning as we uh, sing praises to you. Lord, as a brother brings a message this morning, I just pray that you would open our hearts, that we would listen to what you have to say to us. Lord, that it would make a change in our lives this week, that you would encourage us in our faith go forward and be able to share our faith with others. Lord, for those others that are not here this morning because of health concerns or whatever reason, we just pray that your hand would be upon them. Pray for our pastor and his family as they're vacationing this week. We just pray that you would refresh them and bring them back energized and again ready to serve you in their capacity. Lord, we just thank you for being the God that you are. We pray that you would, uh, again, once again, bless the rest of our service today. Praise to Jesus' name, amen. If you take your Bibles, we'll be reading out of Psalms chapter 147. Psalms 147. And as you find that, if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's Word, we'll be reading Psalms 147, 1 through 6 this morning. Psalms 147, 1 through 6, if you follow along with me as I read. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Israel. He gathers together the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is the Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked 
down to the ground. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. If you take your hymnals, oh well, wait a minute, we're going to back up. Go ahead and be seated. We do have a uh, offering special this morning. I think. The Bickles. Oh, here. And just uh, so you know, the offering plates are in the back, and as uh, you have opportunity, you drop your offering there so we can maintain social distancing. stopped into the church and uh, we were coming by and Karen said that we that says 
welcome Pastor Ted. And I thought, what? And we thought we'd scoped out the church, we thought we were in the right place. And so we looped back around, came back around again, and the Methodist church is welcoming their new pastor, apparently, and his name is Ted. And I thought, whoa. The, uh, so uh, I guess we need to give him greetings somewhere along the way. But uh, we're glad to be with you today. The Lord has opened this door for us. We're glad that your pastor gets away. I was a pastor for 41 years. Currently, I serve, well, right now, I'm unemployed from Lighthouse uh, Industries in, in Carroll, Michigan. I serve as a chaplain there, and of course, with the virus the way it is, that's been shut down. Uh, can't visit the hospitals, those kind of things. So uh, it's a great opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Philippians chapter one, uh, chapter three, verses ten. Uh, is the precedent for us to begin our time together as we look at the God we know and by whom we are known. Uh, it's wonderful to have a God who's alive. We don't have a God we carry in our pockets or we bow down to outside in our yard or any of those uh, misconceptions that the world has so often. We have a God who's alive and who's aware, uh, who knows you, who knows me, and the God desires for us to know him, to know him better. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Uh, truly, Christianity calls the believer unto death. But he, there is a God that you can know. And there are those who would tell us that no finite mind, such as humans, could ever comprehend anything of an infinite God, uh, which you know, our God is. Uh, I had a brain scan a number of years ago. There was some concern there. So they gave me a brain scan, and they didn't find anything. So a lifetime suspicion has been medically confirmed uh, that you can interpret that any way you, you want. But uh, I submit to you today that there is a God who expects us to fully understand who he is, not necessarily knowing every aspect of him. Uh, the truth is that can't be done. There's a story told of a, uh, a four-year-old that was, the classroom assignment was to draw a picture of a Bible character, a person in the Bible. And as the teacher was going around the room, checking out what was happening, he stopped at a little girl's desk and he said, well, who, who are you drawing? She goes, I'm drawing God. He said, well, the problem with that is nobody knows what God looks like. She goes, they will when I get finished. And the reality is that when you look at Jesus Christ, you know what God looks like. Uh, he is the God of love and compassion and provision. He is the God of supervision in your life, and he desires you. But how can we know anything about God? How is it that we have this mystery that's unveiled before us? How can we get to know better uh, this God who is worthy of our coming to know him? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you have your Bible, you want to flip there, and I'll just read it to you. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says this of him. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. It says, But it's written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of, God, of man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but by the Spirit of God. So the things of God are revealed to us through the Spirit of God, having a relationship with him, the indwelling of that Holy Spirit abides with you. So I submit to you today that there is a God's intent to reveal himself to us, not only through the Holy Spirit, but through another means whereby we can grow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this concerning this revelation that is available to us from God. Chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, it says, For God who commended the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Truly, what God has revealed to us, he desires for us to know. And 
In verse 29 of Deuteronomy 29, I like it when you can, it's easy to remember which one's which, but Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God has revealed to us certain things that he wants us to know of him. Certain things are too heavy for us. Certain things we can't handle. We really don't understand justice. The fullness of justice is something that's too, mo too wonderful for us. Uh, in the, in the, the grace and the mercy and the love and compassion of God, justice has its place. And justice, uh, justice is harsh. Justice is hard. Full justice may not always meet with what you expect it to be. We don't have the capacity of God who knows the big picture, who knows all the details. He knows the end from the beginning, so he knows what is just, what is right, what is wholesome, what is, what is right and pure. So the, what God has revealed to us is what he expects for us to know. Don't trouble yourself with things that are too wonderful for you, too wonderful for you. Don't trouble yourself with things that God hasn't revealed. So oftentimes people get sidetracked from faith because they don't understand what something may seem to be an inappropriate action that God allows. And when you look at the world today, you wonder where, where is God in all of this? And God is very much right there working his will. We all know that it's going to get worse before it gets better as the world deteriorates and becomes more and more alienated from the one who created him in the first place. We know that things are going to get worse, so we, we stand in a place where we have to depend upon God to be in control because it's out of our control. There's nothing we can do but to be faithful to the calling that he has revealed for us to be. So some of the things God has kept to himself, and we need to leave it with that. that that's, that's a God thing. And let God work out the details and not try to second-guess him. The God of heaven and earth can be known personally. You can have a personal relationship with that mighty power that spoke the world into existence, who whispered your name to come to him and find peace that passes understanding. Some of us may not have that peace today. And why is it that we don't have that peace? Are we putting our place, ourselves in the place of God where we're questioning what he's doing? That we are chiding him for not doing what we think he should be doing? Where is the peace that comes with, with God? In John chapter 17, verse 3, it says, and this is life eternal, that they may know the, that we may know thee and the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That's how you come to know God is through Jesus Christ, which is the revelation of God in the flesh. The fullness of God had bodily, as the scripture has told us. And it's found that just Jesus Christ alone is the one who can answer the problems that you have putting your trust in him, recognizing that he knows full well what God has done. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 9, 9 through 11, let me find that for you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says this, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, being Jesus Christ, and given him, uh, him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we recognize Jesus Christ, we recognize that it's all part of God's plan. He sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ willingly came to be the propitiation or the payment in full for us. And it is above all else that God has a desire that mankind is becomes known of him and to him and through him and for him in Jesus Christ and his cross work. Hosea 6.6 6 says this, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God desires our obedience and mercy that we come to him in the understanding that he is a God who's in that revelation. Now, that kind of smacks of first... Samuel 15. If you know the scenario where Samuel came to Saul, and Saul had offered an offering that it wasn't his to offer, very oftentimes we're willing to sacrifice where we haven't been called to sacrifice. We're willing to do something that somebody else ought to be doing, stepping in the place where God's will is not perfected. And Saul had 
been waiting for Samuel, and he came to the conclusion that Samuel was late. And so he offered an offering that wasn't the king's place to offer. It was meant for Samuel. And he, he rebukes him with the understanding that God has a place for you, and God has a place for me, and what I need to do, I need to do before God. And what you need to do, you need to be before God. And your place is to answer God's will for you. But he reports that Saul uh, has now disobeyed what God had told him to be. He told him to be the king, to be the warrior, to do your thing, and let me do mine. And that's really the God's desire for us is that we would, we would obey rather than sacrifice. And so oftentimes we can categorize ourselves as a sacrificial servant and we'll do what, what no matter what, whether we're called to do it or not, we'll just fill the void. And actually it, it's a place that we ought not to be. God has called us to serve him in the way he gives us leadership. And to know God better, the better you get to know God, the know, you will know how to serve him in fulfillment of your calling and, and his, uh, his calling in your life. And that's really the desire of God, that you would know what God desires of you, and you'd be busy about that task, not worried about somebody else's failure, but your obedience. Even above sacrifices, God desires obedience, whether you be a king or whether you be a pauper whatever it might be, that God wants you to serve him in the capacity he's called you to be. So how can we get to know this true God, this God who lives, this God who's alive, this God who has a plan, God who works his plan? Uh, God is uh, indeed a complex uh, individual, and knowing him is a complex business, and it takes effort and energy. How, do, how, how much do you invest getting to know God? How much do you take for granted? How much do you lean on other people's knowledge of him to gain a knowledge of him for yourself? How much of it is self-worth? It takes energy, it takes time, it takes effort. Like getting to know your neighbor it takes energy, it takes time, it takes effort. That's true of knowing God, it's true of knowing your neighbor, it's true of knowing your wife it knows, or your spouse. It's true of you to know anything about anything, whether it be a hobby or whatever it is that God has called in you into your life, even a, a new language takes time and effort and energy. Anything you're going to learn is going to have to be an investment from you to do that. So it's interesting that Jesus told his disciples, he called them to him and, and asked them to learn of him. Matthew chapter 11. You probably know uh, that passage where he's, he's uh, given them the invitation to come on to him. All that labor. And the invitation resonates even into the 21st century, uh, even into the state of Michigan, where we have the opportunity of studying God's word and, and yielding to the Holy Spirit and calling God our God rather than some uh, figment of people's imagination. But uh, Jesus said to them, come on to me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's, that's God's ultimate desire is that you would learn of him that you would go from what's commonly known in, in the world by man to who you'd have an intimate relationship with the knowledge of God through Christ Jesus. That's really his call for you in, in your life to get to know him better. He wants you to come near to him. He invites you to come and find rest for your soul. So the room, the question before the room this, this morning is, do, do you have rest in your soul? Do you have peace with God? If not, why not? If you're not comfortable with what God is doing, spend some time with him and get your heart right to where you recognize that he's in control. To take knowledge of, of someone demands that kind of energy and effort. In Proverbs chapter 2, we have counsel from, from Solomon uh, talking to uh, his son in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide them, my commandments with, with thee, so that thou incline unto the ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart unto understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as, as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. A buckler was a small shield that fit over the forearm 
of a warrior. And he would put that buckler on his arm. Then he would put his hand in the, the grips for the shield, which was larger, and it was meant to, to protect the body. The buckler, when you lost the shield, you had the buckler to ward off hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was more nippable. And that's what God wants to be. He wants to be your protection in the intimacies of fight life's battles. When you are standing uh, against the foe and he's re wreaking his bows upon you, he, he wants to be your buckler. He wants to be there. Uh, th these, this, what you find here when you, when you seek after what God wants you to have is it comes with the issue of, of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And those three are really a, a three-legged stool that stand better together than alone. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge it's God's the what we get that is in God's Bible, God's holy word. Um, this there is a, a, a reading I came across years ago. I can't remember where I was now, but it says, "This is my Bible." If you have your Bible with you, it ought to be in your lap. But this is my Bible. It's God's holy word. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. It is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. Sin in my life will keep me from this book. And this book in my life will help keep me from sin. Learn of Jesus. This book has and will change my life. In it, I learn of Jesus and God's love for me. Nowhere else we learn such a thing. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength my Redeemer. May my life bring praise and glory to God forever. And may I do better as I know him better. Amen and amen. It's a prayer that we can have when you're, when you're reading this book. For this book and your life will help you to keep from sin. But to be away from this book will put you in a place where sin can conflict you. So the complex official challenge is that of the path that we see here in this demand for study of the Word of God, it is the only thing that will satisfy the hunger in the soul of even those who say that they know about God. They might know about God, but they don't have a piece of passive understanding. They don't have victory in life's trials. There is a reason why the believer who's in fellowship with God has, has a thankful spirit that he understands what he's been forgiven from. That's how you learn to forgive, when you recognize how much you've been forgiven and how much grace that took on God's part to forgive us that sin. But to know him and to give his son in the person of Jesus Christ a deeper knowledge, a knowledge that grows deeper than just the flesh, just the, the skin of the knowledge of God, the, the common soul that knows about God is empty. It doesn't go any deeper than the skin. It doesn't go to the heart. It never reaches where God intended for it to be. It takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes uh, the desire to inspect and explore what is it that God has said to me in his word, his person. Who is he really? Who is this God who has provided for me something I never could have done for myself? The... You see, he knows you. God knows you well. You will, if you miss what God wants for you, you will miss the purpose he has for you on earth, the time you're here. What's interesting about now is the, we believe the time is growing close to the end. We believe the world stage is set. Uh, the next thing on God's calendar of events is the rapture of the church. Nothing else needs to happen prior to that event. And so when you think about a basketball coach. He wants his best players on the floor in the best, in the, toward the end of the game. He'll actually sacrifice a player in the middle of the game to save him for the end. And when you put yourself into that arena, you are here at the end of the dispensation we call the church. And he wants his best players on the court. How do you fare? How do you think about there are those players who say, I want the ball. The, life, the game's on the line. It's almost over. It's up to me to make a difference. Are you that kind of player? Or you're, are you one of those that say, you know, coach, take me out. 
put somebody who can handle the situation better than me. Where are you in your growth pattern to God? And you see, God knows you. He knows the ups and downs. He knows you inside and out. He knows you front and back, upside and side, up and down. He knows you. He knows who you are. He knows his plan for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. That's a frightening thing when you think you know yourself, but you realize that God really knows the, the intent of my heart. Not just my heart, but the intent of my heart. We need to grasp that. We need to, to behold that thought. We need to ponder that for a moment. Let that sink in, that God is not fooled. He knows what he's got in me, and he knows that I am willing or am I willing to be what he's called me to be. You can't fool God. He's not, he not only knows you, but he knows your needs. He's right now, this very moment, he knows what's tugging at your heart. He knows if you are saying, yeah, that's me, or, whoa, that's not me, and how do I get to be more mature in the things of God? He knows what's, what's tugging at your heart, and he desires that you know the battle is not over. You still have breath. He still has a calling in your life. He still has a purpose for you. There's a value in you. Jesus challenges disciples, disciples there in chapter 11 to come to him. Don't do it on your own. You can't serve God on your own strength. You need to come to him. In fact, he called them to come apart and rest a while. There's a time when you need to take a break. You need to take a breath. I'm so glad that your pastor is away on vacation. People don't understand the pressures in the pastor. Uh, he loves you. He prays for you. Your burdens are his burdens. He he goes to bed with those burdens. He, his heart is broken when you're broken. His heart aches when you ache. And that's the, the order of a shepherd. That's the beauty of a shepherd, is one who knows the sheep and one who loves the sheep enough to sacrifice for them as well. But Jesus said to come to him and to learn of him. He doesn't want you to follow him in ignorance. He wants you to be very well aware of what God's intention is for you through Jesus Christ. He says, learn of me and find rest for your soul. You're not going to find rest with God unless you know who God is and what he's done for you and what Jesus Christ means in all of that. Because without Jesus Christ, there is no rest for the soul. Without that uh, sacrificial death and burial and then the resurrection. The resurrection changes everything. We have a living God, a living Savior. Not some piece of wood, not some piece of stone, but rather a vibrant, functional, caring human being who died for your sins. Fully man, fully God. The hypostatic union is what they refer to it as. He is 100% man, 100% God. And in that camaraderie of spirit, he has the, uh, the mindset of what you need and what the solution is for that problem. So you have rest in your soul today. That's really the struggle that we need to, to come up with uh, as we ponder this truth. I know God. I know he knows me. I know he loves me. Am I mutually respecting and loving him back in return? The death over, God has called us to death. Death over things of the earth. So oftentimes we fall in love with the things of the earth with certain that we came not with nothing into the world, and we'll certainly leave with nothing in the world. We'll leave it all behind. And yet we so often set our affections on things of earth that will rust, that will rot and rust and corrupt. But God will never do that. This is the God who has revealed to us enough to command our loyalty. There's uh, the antidote of all of this is knowing that God is for us. That's really the first solution we need to come to realize that God's not your enemy. He's not looking to hurt you. He's looking to help you. He's looking to heal you from whatever it is. In Psalms 56, verse 9, it says, When I cry unto, the, unto thee, talking to the Lord, then shall mine enemies turn back, for this I know, for God is for me. God is on your side. You can go to bank on that. That he'll never leave you nor forsake you because he tells us that he's with us in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He is also in us. He's the abiding comforter who abides with the believer. Through thick and thin, he's not fair weathered. He's not fickle. He's with you 
from beginning to end of that relationship, which we call a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. First Corinthians, uh, or Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That means it's sustaining. It's not something you, you get and lose. You have it for a few days and it goes away. Even David, when he was praying, he said, to remove not the joy of my salvation. Uh, he was contented that God was going to hear him, but somehow the mirth of that relationship was gone away. When you have sin abiding in your life, it's hard to have fellowship with God. Look at Adam and Eve. One minute they're walking in the cool of the day, the next day they're hiding in the, in the bushes. Didn't want to be in his presence because sin convicted them of the guilt of being in the presence of righteousness. That's why a believer, when he's in sin, he knows he's in sin. He doesn't need somebody to tell him he's in sin. He needs somebody to tell him how to get away from that sin. A friend to come along and he, which is spiritual, give him advice to get away from that which he's been blinded to. Got a blind spot? Thank God for a friend who will come along and say, you know, you don't see this coming, but you know, the devil's got a hook in you. We'll look at some of that tonight. We're going to look at one of them. Satan's favorite tools, one of the most successful tools that Satan constantly uses. We'll be looking at that tonight. But he's also beyond us. As much as he is for us and with us and in us, he's also beyond, beyond us. He, his abode is in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 55, we have this uh, confidence of him. It says, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He is aloof from us. He is not contaminated by the things that distort us. But at the same time, as much as he might be aloof of us, beyond the temptations of the flesh, he's also in love with us. John 3.16 tells us, maybe you can help me with this, for God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's the glory of it that God loves us so much that he made the debt of our sin paid Jesus Christ paid it all everything that he, we need is available through Jesus Christ it is just and holy God who serves us. Our, and he deserves our devotion, our love, and our praise. That's the least we can do is to give him that kind of honor for what God has done for us. And that resurrection saves us from his suffering and his cross and his death and his tomb. That's not next on our agenda. Our next agenda is in fellowship with him. Whether we live or die, we are at peace with God. Whether we are on earth or in heaven, we are in communion with him. That's the beauty of eternal life and eternal security that God has provided for us. May God be so blessed to have a, a, a warrior uh, who understands that there is peace to be had through the presence of, of the Holy Spirit in your life, knowing God better by studying his book. And that's why he gave us the Bible that we might have the tools we need to resist the evil one and to be a prophet for him on the earth. Father, we come today recognizing that you have a call for us. We recognize that you know us inside and out in every which way other. But Father, we know that we have a responsibility, even a, a compulsion, to know you better. And I thank you that you are knowable, that you have revealed to us things in your Bible that we can know for sure that you are indeed a God who loves us, who God is for us, and who God is with us, and we know that you abide in us. We thank you for that confidence we have in your precious Son. We thank you for the plan of redemption which he has secured for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the record of your scripture that we can come to know you better. Help us to be students of your word, not, need not to be ashamed. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name.
stand with me and turn to 510, near to the heart of God.